Well, hello, and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg, and I'm reading Gone with the Wind, so you don't have to. I was joking with Erica from The Broken Spine that I feel like that should be the new catchphrase for my channel. Obviously, it won't be, because I won't be reading Gone with the Wind forever, and I certainly would never presume to tell people you shouldn't read Gone with the Wind, but it still amuses me, so I thought I would throw it in there. Anyway, Happy Friday Reads. I am recording this on Friday. I will post it on a Saturday. Time means nothing on social media because you might be watching this two weeks from now. It is what it is. But anyway, it's Friday Reads time. That's the only thing that matters. So it's time to catch up on the reading week and everything bookish that has gone on in it. I will get to the Friday Reads portion of this video a little toward the end. Just a couple of things I want to run through first. The big news that happened in the book world this week is that the Booker longlist was announced. I will put my reaction video down below. Lots of fun comments. By the way, I should mention now, I have fallen wildly behind on replying to comments. It's just been a really busy work week. Last week was really busy and everything's just kind of piled up. And I feel like every time I start replying to comments, I'll get like one or two done and then I get pulled away into something else. and never quite make it back. So if you have left a comment that I have not responded to, I am very sorry. I wanted to try to catch up, but usually what ends up happening when I fall this far behind is I try to decide to just start fresh on another video <laughs> and try to be better going forward. So I have looked at all of the comments that have been on my previous videos. I just haven't really had a chance to respond to them. So I apologize if you left a comment and did not get a response. I try to respond to everybody. I'm not 100% edit and this week in particular I've been really bad so anyway all this to say that I had a lot of really great responses to the Booker Prize long list reaction video a lot of really thoughtful reactions to the books personally I enjoy that this long list was something that was mostly unfamiliar to me I like to look at long lists as a tool of discovery so I find out about more books that I might not otherwise have found so this year's long list pretty perfectly went in there I don't know how many of the books I will ultimately end up reading, but I did put a hold at the library for The Great Circle and The Sweetness of Water. The other ones were not immediately available, so I'm just gonna let myself free flow and you know, maybe when people talk about them, maybe when the shortlist is announced, I will think about them. But those two I'm thinking about pretty seriously. We'll see how that goes. And again, I will put my reaction video to the Booker Prize long list in the description box down below. I would like to mention that August is Women in Translation Month. If you are unfamiliar, the point is pretty much what it sounds like. The goal is to read women who have written books that were translated into English. I would like to try to get a book that qualifies for that in in August, but I'm going to see how that goes because I'm trying not to put reading pressure on myself and I have fallen really far behind on Gone with the Wind. And this week I was thinking about that and it took me about two months to read Lonesome Dove, and I was really enjoying Lonesome Dove. So I think it's probably not too surprising that it's taking me a longer time to get through Gone with the Wind. The main stressor with Lonesome Dove was that the pandemic happened. I started it right as lockdown hit and all of that stuff and stress and everything made it a little difficult to read. The thing with Gone with the Wind is that I get irritated after a while. So because I'm so far behind, the buddy read that I was planning for August has been pushed back to the second half of the month, and I don't know if I'll get to a print book, but if you watched my book haul from this week for July, which I will also link in the description box down below, I had gotten a copy of There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job by Kukuko Tsumura, specifically thinking I could do it for Women in Translation Month. And now I don't know if I'm going to get to it or not because it's a print book and Gone with the Wind is eating up all of my print book energy right now. And then the buddy read that I do at the end of August will also be a print book. So I may seek out something on audio that would qualify, but we'll see how that goes. I just wanted to bring it up so I can put Women in Translation Month on your radar if you would like to pick up some books by women who have been translated because I have participated at, with at least one book the last two years and I have enjoyed that. So I'd like to keep it going if possible. I've been watching the Olympics a lot, as you can imagine, but I'm very torn about that because on the one hand, I do struggle with whether or not it is responsible to be holding the Olympics right now in a country that does not have a very high vaccination rate and where cases are going up. 
And at the same time, I totally get sucked into watching them. So I feel guilty, but I'm still watching. And that's where I'm at. And it's funny because I'm a huge fan of gymnastics. I get into swimming and I am not a huge fan of the track and field events. So I might drop off a little bit next week because track and field will be the majority of the big of, of sporting events going on next week. But uh, I've been really enjoying following along with it. The coverage is kind of weird, especially since with the time zone, there's no way to avoid spoilers if you're on social media at all during the day because so many people report on what happened and it just is impossible to avoid them and yet when you watch it they're trying to create a narrative for suspense and it just feels bizarre like the women's all-around gymnastics final was last night i already knew the winner and yet they tried to create suspense by getting to the final event and then taking like an hour or an hour and a half away to go cover swimming for a while. And it's just mind boggling because it's like they're pretending that this is all happening live. And yet it's not. You could have easily just put it all together in one. It, anyway, it's fun. It's like they're creating a storyline out of it. And I understand why they do that. And I don't think I'm really explaining what I'm trying to say very well. But it's just bizarre. And I'm happy for Suni Lee. And I am very proud of Simone Biles. I will stand up for her. I think she is an incredible person and stepping out of the competition for her own mental health is a huge thing that I hope changes the conversation around sports a lot because it can be so critical. You watch these things and you know that the judges have to take all of the things that the announcers say into question. And yet, it does create this sense of overwhelming negativity when someone does this amazing flip and the person immediately says they didn't get a full rotation and they kind of wobbled on the landing and that's going to be a huge deduction. It's kind of like, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't do half of that. So, you know, it's a little bit tough, especially diving. I feel like one of the announcers in diving was just wildly negative about everything, but that, you know, it is what it is. So... I hope that the conversation around sports and how they are presented and how the athletes are treated does change over time. But that's not the kind of a conversation we are to have here. The only other thing that's been going on this week outside of reading, because I have not been doing a lot of audiobook listening, and we'll get to that in the Friday Reads, but I started listening to a new podcast, a new-to-me podcast called The Plot Thickens. It is put out by TMC, and it is about movies. I really wanted to listen because the second season is about the creation of the bonfire of the vanities, the movie. So there is sort of a bookish angle to this. I read that book. That book is trash on like a Gone with the Wind level. Um, eh, Gone with the Wind is probably a little bit bigger. But anyway, the movie is legendary for being like a bad adaptation. And the podcast is supposed to follow it. And there was a book because they invited a journalist onto the set. And this journalist got to witness all of the crazy stuff that happened in the making of the movie. And she went on to write a book called The Devil's Candy, which I have been wanting to read forever and not gotten around to. So the podcast kind of follows that book and all of the stuff that happened. So the second season is what I really wanted to get to, but the first season is about Peter Bogdanovich, who directed The Last Picture Show and uh, Paper Moon and uh, What's Up Doc and a, a bunch, couple of other things. And I wanted to get through that to get to the Bonfire of the Vanities conversation. And it was interesting because there's also a podcast that I like called You Must Remember This, which looks at the secret or forgotten history of Hollywood's first century. And they did a season about Peter Bogdanovich's first wife, Polly, and how she was his quiet inspiration and how after he cheated on her with Sybil Shepard during the making of The Last Picture Show, they ultimately split up and started working differently. They never worked together after a certain after Paper Moon, I believe. And how his career went a little bit south after that. And the two podcasts have very different views of what happened, which is interesting. You must remember this very much takes Polly's side and talks about how she was quietly the person who was steering the ship creatively with Peter Bogdanovich. And Peter Bogdanovich, for obvious reasons, denies that vociferously. But there's no denying that after they separated creatively and in personal lives as well, 
his career never quite matched the success of his the, of those first movies that he had made. And it's interesting as well because in You Must Remember This, they talk about how once Polly was sort of out of the picture, Sybil Shepard really pushed Peter Bogdanovich to do vehicles for her. And in this new podcast, The Plot Thickens, they don't really address that. They kind of mention that his next movie happened to be Daisy Miller, which was a star vehicle for Sybil Shepard. And his next movie after that happened to be a musical with the music of Cole Porter starring Sybil Shepard, who had wanted to do a musical and suggested the Cole Porter songbook. And, you know, it, they just kind of gloss over those things. So it's interesting what's left out of this one that was in the other one. And it's interesting what they bring up in this one that was not in the other one. So, again, it's not a book thing strictly speaking, but it was fascinating and infuriating because also Peter Bogdanovich, pretty hardcore, like womanizing behavior over time. And the host of the show forgives a lot of these sort of terrible things that he says about that. Like at one point he talks about how, oh, there's a special relationship between a director and his leading lady, which I object to on well, the one hand because it assumes that directors are males but, you know, whatever. But he's trying to say, oh, there's always a special relationship. You know, you always get romantically involved with your leading lady because there's such an intense relationship. It's like, okay, but by that logic, you should be getting involved with your leading men as well and having deep, profound relationships with them. But you don't. But the host doesn't question this. He just sort of says like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems totally reasonable. <laughs> it's like, no, it doesn't actually. But anyway, I should stop talking about that because, again, not a bookish thing. Let's get to the question from my 3K Q&A. If you follow along, you know I am going through the last remaining questions from my 3K Q&A that I did not get to in a single video. This week's comes from Jessica Hall, and her question is, it seems like publishing would be a perfect job for you. What made you leave the industry? It would be easy for me to just say that I moved to Montana because technically that is what made me leave the publishing industry. I went moved from New York City to Montana and there's not much of a publishing industry out here. So that kind of necessitated me to leave publishing and find something else to do. But the truth is I was already looking to leave publishing by the time we moved. So about a year before we moved here, I started looking for other jobs and then started thinking maybe I'd be better off getting out of publishing. So I had just started applying for jobs outside of publishing when we moved to Montana. And it was mostly for that reason that I felt like I could do similar work, get more out of it creatively and financially. Like I applied for a job in editorial at one point and the person even told me, it's like, well, we used to have two people that did this job, but now we only have one. So to be honest with you, you will be doing the job of two people, but we're only going to pay you for the one. And that's kind of what happens. And that's another reason I was thinking of getting out of publishing. Publishing is still a great industry. The people who are in publishing do it because they love books, they love literature, and they want to share that with people in whatever department that they are in. And it's not without problems. And I think it's important to try to recognize both things, that publishing is trying to do a lot of good things and that it can also use a push forward, especially in terms of diversity. So that is ultimately why I left publishing. And thank you for the, the good question, Jessica. That was a very good question. I'm sorry it took me so long to get to it. Let's move into the actual Friday Reads portion of this video where I don't have a lot to report because the two books that I was... Well, I have a lot to report. I'm going to talk about Gone with the Wind. Woo! <laughs> you are going to hear about it. But uh, the two books that I was reading last week are the same two books that I'm reading this week. So let's talk about the audiobook first, get that out of the way. It was The Tuscan Child by Reese Bowen. And if you remember from last week, I was struggling a little bit because I don't know if it's that I wasn't really paying attention, but I sort of felt at arm's length from the book and was struggling to get through it a little bit. Well, that continued. And it was furthered by the fact that I'm using The Tuscan Child to tick a box on my reading challenge for the Montana Book Company. I need a book that was recommended by a friend. Well, a friend recommended The Tuscan Child to me last year and gifted us a copy of the audiobook on Audible. 
Now, I don't like Audible because it's owned by Amazon and I don't use it, but they gave me a gift. So I have the Audible app for this. And for some reason, this week, the audio will not play if my phone goes to sleep. And I'm sure you can imagine that has really stopped my progress because I'm not always on my phone when I want to listen to an audiobook. If I take the dogs for a walk, I'll frequently listen to an audiobook. But I'm not on my phone. It's in my pocket. But now if it's in my pocket, it won't play. So that became a problem. And I started thinking about diving back into it, maybe starting over. And then I was thinking about maybe just trying something new. So I have two or three audiobooks that I'm looking at. I asked Doris for some recommendations to hit a different challenge on my little uh, list of things that I need to do. So I might do one of them. I might do something else to be determined, but that's where I'm at with audiobooks right now. Let's get into Gone with the Wind. Now, I have not picked up Gone with the Wind in two days. Instead, I've been actually looking at and Birds, which was a gift from Doris. A field guide to identification. It's just a fun little thing that I've been doing on the side to distract myself because I needed a refresh before I go back into Gone with the Wind. So, I'm a little less than halfway through Gone with the Wind at this point, and... Here's what I'm going to say. So the part that I got through this week is probably the most thrilling part of the movie. And I'm going to guess it's probably also the most thrilling part of the book. It is the part where Scarlet is in Atlanta. The war is going badly for the Confederacy. And Sherman takes Atlanta. The city's on fire. Scarlet has to make a quick escape. She gets back to Terra. And when she gets there, she finds that a lot of the neighboring homes have been destroyed and she finds that her mother died the day before she got home. All that happens in the middle of the book, middle of the movie. I feel like the moratorium on spoilers for Gone with the Wind has gone out the window. No pun intended. I really did not intend to do that. But there you go. It happened. So, by the way, Margaret Mitchell's biography, which I had looked at last week, says that at one point her mother was sick with typhoid and died the day before Margaret Mitchell got home to visit her. So she wrote that into Scarlett's experience. It's a very dramatic section and it is thrilling. I will give it that. It's thrilling in the movie and it is just as thrilling on the page. It's a great set piece. It really capitalizes on drama. There are a lot of little manipulations that Margaret Mitchell does to put Scarlet in the position where she is, because as a lady at that time, she wouldn't have been there to witness the fall of Atlanta. She would have escaped from the city and gone home or gone to another place, because that's what a lot of other women and children did. They fled the city. They didn't want to stay. They were so worried that Yankees were going to come and take advantage of them. And I think you know what I mean when I say take advantage of them. So Margaret Mitchell contrives to have Melanie get pregnant. And Melanie is thin-hipped. They keep using thin hips as an explanation that she's going to have a very bad pregnancy. But so they know it's going to be a difficult pregnancy and they say she shouldn't move. So because she needs to take care of Melanie, Scarlett and Melanie both have to stay in Atlanta. And then as the days go on, they end up trapped because Melanie is due any day and she ends up giving birth the same day that Atlanta falls. And it creates a situation in which they can be there to witness the fall of Atlanta for the reader or for the viewer in the movie. And it really works because it actually heightens the tension to have Melanie in such a vulnerable state, Scarlett, who up to this point has been selfish and irresponsible in the position of being a caretaker because then when Melanie goes into labor, she can't find a doctor. Nobody can come because there are so many wounded Confederate soldiers. It's a really thrilling section in both the movie and the book, but it's also wildly problematic. So as thrilling as it is, it also ended up kind of exhausting me because it reveals a lot about what's going on underneath the surface of this book. And a lot of that has to do with the character of Prissy. And if you've seen the movie or if you've read the book, you know Prissy is sort of played for laughs. She is the lazy black woman who works for Scarlet. I say works for, she was enslaved. And she is lazy. She is a little bit frivolous. And she's basically useless. She promises Scarlet that she knows all about 
how to birth a baby and then it turns out she knows absolutely nothing about it at all. So Scarlet has to do it herself. So this is problematic already because it's using Prissy to show that Scarlet is stronger. Scarlet is better. Prissy is unprepared for the world. She's stupid. She's lazy. She is useless and incapable of getting by on her own. If Scarlet weren't there, it, you would get the sense that Prissy would just sort of hide in a hole in the ground. And that would be where she would stay until whatever happened happened. And it creates this sense, once again, because the way we are introduced to enslaved people in this book is that there is a wild horse that can't be tamed and it tramples some of the black people and they are afraid of it and it describes them as hanging from the rafters while a white woman calmly handles the situation calms the horse down and takes care of it so it creates this idea of black people not being competent and not being able to do anything. Melanie gets a pass in this situation because she is so ill she, and her pregnancy is going so badly that she is in danger of dying. Melanie gets a complete pass from the situation, but Prissy comes off really badly. And it reveals that dynamic of what Margaret Mitchell probably actually thinks about people of different races. Again, given the fact that when I was looking into her biography last week, I found that she really loved the writings of a white supremacist when she was a teenager, to the point that she reenacted them wearing a Ku Klux Klan robe. Yeah. But the other thing is that it reveals just what a thin facade Scarlett's friendly relationship with Prissy is, because up to this point, Prissy has been a little bit irresponsible, she's been a little bit lazy, not so hardworking. But it's treated like, oh, but whatever, it's it's fine, she's a good girl. And she and Scarlett have a sort of friendly relationship. But the second there's trouble, the power dynamic comes out, and it's not great. And I can see where you read this and you don't even notice it happening. I can see where you'd watch the movie and not even notice that it's happening. But the second there's trouble, Scarlett becomes abusive to Prissy. Scarlett curses Prissy out. She calls her the N-word. And I had been thinking that there's a remarkably small amount of uses of the N-word in this book. However, after, at a, at a later point in the book, Scarlett reflects on how she called Prissy the N-word and thinks her mother would be ashamed of her for using such a low word. And it's kind of like polite society doesn't use that word. They just, you know, still enslave people, but they don't use the word. So the second there's trouble, Scarlett becomes abusive. Scarlett uses the n-word she threatens prissy she tells her she's going to sell her and make sure that she ends up being a field hand a field hand there's a hierarchy of enslaved people and if you're a field hand you're at the bottom if you work in the house you have a little bit of agency and maybe a little bit of power but clearly in this situation it's revealed that you have no power at all i mean think about this relationship where you can tell somebody the second they're of no use to you well, joke's on you because I'm going to sell you and you're going to have a miserable life for the rest of your life, however long it may be. And that's, oh, oh, oh boy, it's, uh, it's a lot. So by the time I got to the part where Scarlet is back at Tara, I kind of needed a break because as much as that section was thrilling enough that you really get through all of the suspense and it really pulls you forward, it was so deeply troubling to me and deeply problematic that I had to put it down and take a little bit of space because it reveals a lot about this dynamic. Margaret Mitchell is creating this sense that it, slavery in the South was a friendly thing and people were happy. And yet the second there's a challenge, the truth comes out. And I don't think Margaret Mitchell probably even realized the ways in which the truth was coming out about that power dynamic because she probably didn't see it herself. And it's troubling to me. So I'm going to keep working my way through this book and see where it goes. I imagine I already have a pretty good sense of what my opinion of this book is. And it's interesting, too, because even reflecting on the movie, it feels like we've hit the high point of the movie. Everything else, there will be conflicts, there will be more drama, but it feels like everything is sort of slow from here, and yet I'm only, I'm barely halfway through the book, so there's a lot 
to come. A lot to come. And I'm going to need a little bit of time. So I'm not going to rush my way through. It seems like I'm at a pace where I am make it about 100 pages every week. Last week was 150. This week, I think, it was about 100. Uh, I am on page... Oh, I'm on page 407. So I'm not even halfway through this book. Woof. I got a lot to go, guys. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I'm determined to do it. It's funny because I got through all of the Peter Bogdanovich episodes, almost like I was hate listening to them, because I was like, why is nobody calling out this problematic thing that this is doing? And I'm doing the same thing with this. Is this a thing that I do? I'm having a moment of clarity right here. Sometimes I detach from something like, oh, well, you know, screw that. I'm not doing it. But in these two cases, I seem to be like, oh, let me take in all the details so I can talk with authority about what trash this is. So apparently that's a part of my personality that I'm just discovering right now. So thank you for coming along in this moment of discovery for me. Now, before I put down my Gone with the Wind conversation, it was interesting. I am starting to set up the template for my when I work through all of my thoughts about Gone with the Wind for a video or for a post about it in just like one place, not piecemeal in a Friday Reads. And I looked at other books that were released in, I think it was 1936, the same year that Gone with the Wind was released, to see what competition Margaret Mitchell might have had for the Pulitzer Prize. And Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner was published the same year. And I haven't read Absalom, Absalom, so I looked at it and realized it is also a book that is set before, during, and after the Civil War. And part of me thinks it would be really interesting to read Absalom, Absalom as a sort of companion to this and see if it handles the situation any better. But I think I need a break from this topic for a while. Oh, you know what I should do? Brian from Bookish is an authority on William Faulkner, and I should look to see if he has a video about that. I know he has a video about William Faulkner and racism, so I should look for that. Brian, if you're watching this, please put an informed comment down below and educate us all about whether or not Absalom Absalom handles these topics better. Or message me directly, or maybe I'll message you. Anyway, I'm having a conversation with Brian in a video that a lot of people are going to watch. <laughs> and I don't even know if he's going to be watching, so let's leave it at that for today. Like I said, I'm going to determine what my next audiobook is. I'm going to keep working on Gone with the Wind, and hopefully I will be done with it by the middle of August. We'll see how that goes. I would love to hear what you've been up to this week. If you have thoughts about anything that I've said, please put them in the comment section down below, even if your name is not Brian and you are not a William Faulkner expert. <laughs> As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.